<laughs> so, you know, you never know what God's going to do if he tells you to do something a bit strange. <laughs> it's good. Right. Okay, we're going to hear from Nick. I just want to say something, actually, before Nick comes and preaches. Nick is one of the core team leaders, as, as we know, and we really enjoy his preaching. Um, but Nick is incredibly servant-hearted. He didn't know I was going to say He's frowning at me now. He's incredibly servant-hearted. He, um, he comes here before 10 o'clock. We meet at 11. He comes before 10 most Sundays. He puts all the chairs out every week. He spends a long time setting up all the technology. It's been quite a pain and difficult to do over the last few months, you know, trying different things out, buying a microphone, trying all these different things out. And he's just done it. And he honestly is not looking for any kind of thanks or anything like that. He just sees that as that's what you do. You know, that's if you're serving Jesus, then you serve, serve one another, serve the church. And it's just we're really grateful to him for having done that because we he's enabled something while we probably lots of us have still been asleep or you know waking up on a Sunday morning having a nice cup of coffee and thinking oh it's my nice morning I'll go to church at 11 o'clock but you know Nick's been doing all that to enable this for us and we're really really grateful to him and actually he hasn't really been able to preach for quite a few months because he's been doing that and so yeah, I just think, you know, he, he needs a bit of honour. <laughs> Brilliant. Respect you, Nick. Come on up and uh, let's hear from you on Daniel. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so um, they asked me to preach, uh, love Bristol, and uh, they wanted to ease me in gently. So um, they gave me Daniel's dream, the four terrifying beasts, <laughs> just to gently kind of, uh, you know, it's a bit of scripture that theologians have been arguing and continuing arguing about for centuries. Um, so whatever I say, um, half of you are going to think it's great, and the other half's going to think it's a load of rubbish because it's one of those scriptures. Um, so basically, um, put your hand up if you don't know who Daniel is. All right, uh, one of you. Um, so basically, I will go back to the beginning. Once upon a time, God spoke to a man called Abraham, Abraham and he said to him, can people hear me, by the way? Thumbs up if you can hear me, okay? We're just doing some adjustments. So God said to Abraham, um, I'm going to, through you, through your seed, I'm going to create a people, and the people are going to be more numerous than the stars in the sky, grains of sand uh, in the seashore, and uh, I will be your God, you'll be my people, and through you... I will bless the world, all the nations through you. And um, so that was the birth of Israel, the Israel people. And uh, they have their adventures. They were prospering. Um, they were going through uh, maybe a bit of a nomadic lifestyle. Um, went to Egypt, came out of Egypt, uh, found the promised land and um, started to grow. Uh, had a king. They didn't have a king. Uh, God God is their king, but they wanted a king to be like the other nations, so they had a king, built a temple, and, uh, you know, life goes on. And um, so basically, uh, in this part of the story, um, Israel are not behaving very well um, in terms of uh, worshipping idols, a bit of idolatry. Um, uh, the whole of the Babylon army kind of around them, and uh, they're the enemies, they're the, the baddies. They're not really baddies. We'll go into that a little bit later. But um, King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, wants to uh, capture and have dominance over uh, uh, the whole of uh, Judah or Judea. And uh, basically, uh, there's a prophet rise up called Jeremiah. Uh, put your hand up if you haven't heard of Jeremiah. Put your hand up if you haven't got a clue what Jeremiah was talking about. 
Okay. So basically, uh, God is not very happy with Israel at this time. He's actually quite furious with them. And, uh, but because the Israelites at the time were thinking, well, we're God's people, God loves us, um, we can basically do what we want. And uh, there are many prophets which were saying, don't worry about the Babylonians, uh, we're God's people, they will never overthrow us, we, we will be dominant. Um, but one prophet, maybe there are others, but one prophet, uh, Jeremiah, who's a major prophet, he was prophesying, actually, no, unless you turn away from your wicked ways, unless you repent, um, you'll be destroyed. The, uh, the, the Babylon, Babylonians will defeat you. And uh, he was like a, a lone voice. Um, actually, could you click? Um, I can do it. Sorry for you um, on Zoom. Basically, this is some words from Jeremiah. Uh, it's Jeremiah uh, chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed. They cannot hear. Uh, the word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. Now, God is talking about the Israelites. He's not talking about the enemies or anything like that. He's talking about the, the Israelites. They don't want to listen to God. God's giving them warnings after warnings after warnings. And what happens is one day, King Nebuchadnezzar sends his armies. They occupy the whole of Judea. They occupy Jerusalem. And Jerusalem's lost to the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar takes the, um, the king of Israel and he blinds him, uh, but not before murdering his sons in front of him. So he the royal family gets his king's sons, kills his sons, blinds him, and uh, it's all doom and gloom. And uh, it's a very, very, it's a very, very uh, difficult time for the Israelites. Now, a little bit after, this is about between about 600 BC, approximately. Is that right? 2000 BC. None of you know. It's fine. <laughs> take my word it's about six maybe 650 bc and uh what happens is uh uh the king nebuchadnezzar he says just go in to find the nobles of um of israel and uh basically bring them you know they've got to be without uh, blemish healthy handsome young men and uh, intelligent as well so well educated and uh Find, find the cream of the crop, basically, to come and serve me, um, to, serve, to serve me, and uh, we'll teach them the ways of our, of our beliefs, etc. And so they did, and Daniel is one of these men. Um, there's also Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do people know these characters? Yeah. Um, there are other, no, there are others. And uh, Daniel was... He was very, very, very servant-hearted towards King Nebuchadnezzar and also um, those that followed King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he outlived King Nebuchadnezzar, um, so it went on a little bit. Uh, it wasn't just him. There were other kings who took his place. Um, there were things that were going on, but uh, Daniel was seen as being somebody who was uh, very noble by the king, by the Babylonian king, uh, uh, full of honor, honest, but also he served the one true living God before everything else. He was very, very faithful to, um, to our Lord. And um, one example of this was uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and uh, the dream really disturbed him. This isn't the dream I want to talk about, but because uh, Daniel has a dream a little bit of a little bit later but King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he says to all his sort of mystics um, who 
uh, Daniel was one of them. Uh, somebody interpret my dream. And, uh, and if you can't interpret it, I'm going to get you all chopped up into little pieces and killed. And the mystic said, yeah, no problem. Tell me what the dream was. And the king said, uh, no, you tell me what the dream was and then interpret it. And, uh, <laughs> and they were going, well, well no, um, that's not really uh, the way it's done. You know, it's not really fair. Um, if you could just tell us your dream and we'll give you the explanation. And the king says, no, I won't believe that. You tell me what the dream is um, and, and tell me the interpretation or I'll chop you all up into little pieces. And uh, they all kind of shrugged their shoulders and thought, all right, okay, let's go and get chopped up. Uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel said, uh, um, what's going on here? Because he would have been executed along with the other sort of mystics. And uh, they said to Daniel, um, oh, the king sort of, the king's being unreasonable as usual, and, uh, and we're all going to die. And Daniel says, well, let me see the king. And he's, so he goes and sees the king and says, look, um, give us a little bit of time, and then I'll come back. I'll, I'll tell you what your dream is and the interpretation. And the king says, fine, you've got a bit of time. So he goes with his friends. They spend some time praying, with God, uh, praying to God, and then God gives him the dream and the interpretation, and he goes to the king and says, this, this is your dream, this is the interpretation, happy days. They're singing and praising and everyone's happy and, uh, and uh, people looked, with, looked at Daniel as being somebody who hears from God. And actually Daniel said, this is from the one true God, you know, it, it's him who's interpreted this. Anyway, that gives a bit of the background of what's going on, where we are in time. Um, it's, not a, it's not a very good time for Israel. Israel is under siege. They are serving the Babylonians. Uh, there's some Israelites who are really on fire for the one true God, yet um, they're kind of demonstrating that the one true God is much more powerful than the Babylonian gods, yet Israel is still under captivity because... Um, because of their sin, you know, God had told them, this is what's going to happen. And this is currently what was happening. And it went on for about 70 years. Was it about 70 years they were in this scenario? This is pretty early on in the, um, in the picture. I forgot what I was going to talk about. What am I talking about? Talking about, was it Jesus? No. I hope it's not the terrifying beasts. Oh, yeah, it's the terrifying beasts. So, um, a little bit further on uh, in time, uh, Daniel has a dream. And uh, yeah, shall we read it? It's from um, Daniel uh, 7. Now, actually, the people on uh, Zoom can't read this. Uh, if I was there, I'd set it up. It's a bit too complicated. So what I'm going to do is read it out. But if you've got Bibles there, I would encourage you just to go find a Bible, and um, I'm going to read it from the NIV, but it's Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to stop at certain points. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, apologies, I don't, I don't read very well, especially sort of people's names. Um, Nathaniel, when I get it wrong, could you correct me? And... But in general, but in general, in, ge in general, if you could. And Nathaniel was saying that it's uh, Babylonian. It's not in his uh, remit. But anyway, I'll carry on. Um, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was, I can't read that because of the, lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each, of, each different from the others, came out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that, so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of man was given to it. And there before me was a second beach, 
which looked like a bear. It was rised up on its side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your full of flesh. After that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard and on its back, it had four wings like that of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had a large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victim and trampled underfoot where whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. Keep going. When I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came among them and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. The horns had eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. I'll stop there a sec. So, basically, so Daniel in his vision, his dream, saw four terrifying beasts. Now, I'm going to be a little bit controversial. controversial. Um, I don't think he was particularly terrified um, of the first three beasts. And the reason why I think that is because he gets an interpretation of the dream, which covers all four beasts, and then immediately says, yeah, but what about the fourth beast? I think it's the fourth beast he's actually very disturbed by, he's actually terrified of. And uh, the fourth beast um, was different to the others. Uh, I believe possibly rightly or wrongly, I don't know, but this is the Antichrist. I believe that the fourth beast is basically a representation of Satan. If it's, it's, it's referred to the beast in uh, the book of Revelation. I believe it's the same, the same beast who has dominion over the whole earth. Um, I've got reasons to think that's right. Um, I might be wrong, but that's what I believe. But anyway, this beast, I, it, it, it's, there's something different about it. Anyway, I'll carry on reading. Where was I? Oh, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Now, I believe the Ancient of Days is God, if you don't, um, is the Lord. Uh, his clothes were as white as snow. The hair on his head was white like wool. His, th his throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river was flowing, coming out before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Tens of thousands, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the book were opened. Now, when I first read that, I, I thought that was Jesus. Um, I thought that was Jesus sat on the throne and uh, it's referring the thousands upon thousands uh, with the church us basically before god um so it pick, it swings from his beast and then it's got a picture i was thinking it's jesus um and uh and we're serving jesus in the throne room um i'm not sure if it's jesus or god the father or um but you know there's one god he represents so it's god you know i think perhaps god the father but anyway shall we go on then I continue to watch, this is sw so it's switching back from this picture of um, heaven. So it starts with the beast, switches to the picture of heaven and then back to the beast. Then I continue to watch because of the boastful words of the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of the authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was 
one like the Son of Man. And I think this is, you know, reading on, I believe this is Jesus. Um, coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Can we just move on? I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the vision passed through my mind, disturbed me. So um, it's kind of a little bit odd, isn't it? Because you don't kind of really hear how uh, the four beasts were destroyed or, um, or the fourth beast especially was destroyed. It kind of switches to the four beasts. Three are pretty bad. The four is absolutely terrifying. Um, then switches to the Ancient of Days. Um, the Ancient of Days sat on the throne thrones of uh, multitudes of people uh, worshipping him and uh, serving him, switches back to the boastful nature of the fourth beast, um, and it talks about him being boastful, draws, uh, it seems to, do in the vision, draw Daniel's attention because of the boastful nature of him, and until he's destroyed, and then back to, I believe, Jesus. Um, Jesus uh, being exalted to the right hand of the Father and uh, establishing his throne forever. Now, um, I, Daniel, I'm reading from the Bible for, for the Zoom people. My name's not Daniel. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit and the vision that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him, the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are the four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the most high will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Now, you've got to bear in mind, so I, I think this is quite a casual um, response to the question. You know, he was saying, he basically said, these four beasts are, are um, the evil baddies, uh, evil worldly kingdoms. But the saints, us, us, he didn't say God, he says us, the saints, will receive the kingdom, I believe that's a kingdom of heaven, and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Um, so he says, so these are bad kingdoms, yet the saints will receive the kingdom of heaven and will live in relationship with heaven, relationship with God forever and ever. And uh, I think uh, that didn't really um, satisfy Daniel, I don't believe. I think he was still sort of shaken by uh, the fourth beast. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, he asks, um, which was different from all the other beasts and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claw, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the 10 horns on its head and about the other horns that came up, but before which three of them fell out, the horns looked more imposing than the others, and that it had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched this, the horns was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the ancient of days and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the most high. I'll stop there. So the old covenant, Daniel, it's in the old Testament. It's the old covenant, uh, basically as an old covenant, um, the relationship with God is you're justified through faith by uh, following the law through works. So um, you trust God and you obey his, uh, you, you obey his law, and uh, that's, how righteous, that's how righteousness was displayed. The problem is that righteousness cannot come through obeying the law. If you read the book of Romans um, and much of the New Testament, uh, righteousness comes through faith, faith in Jesus. 
because um, Jesus is the one who justifies us. Now, I believe this section here, um, until the ancient of days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, uh, I believe our judgment as Christians is the cross, is the cross. Um, when God ju judges a Christian, he looks at the cross and judges a Christian righteousness because Jesus has paid the ultimate price. Now, I think this is something that uh, Daniel maybe couldn't quite get his head around um, in the covenant he was currently in. I'm not sure. I can't speak for him. I speak from him a little bit, a little bit later. You'll see that I'm speaking for Daniel, but right now I can't speak for Daniel. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll read on. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the kingdoms and devour the, uh, the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are the ten kings who come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise different from the early ones. He will subdue three kings. He speaks against the most high, oppresses his saints, and tries to change the set times and laws. The saints will be handed over him for a time, times and a half, but the court will sit and his power will be taken away completely, destroyed forever. So, um, yeah, I suppose the kind of point I wanted to make in that was you've got to bear in mind that uh, Daniel was under captivity. He was somebody who was serving the most high God. Um, he was somebody who had some sort of understanding of what, what was going on. And yet in this dream, he was revealed to something greater, something bigger. Actually, God had a bigger purpose, which was way beyond um, what, what he could think or comprehend. He saw for the first time, perhaps, uh, or perceived for the first time, perhaps, the grip that Satan has on this world, that the, the power that the, the enemy has on humanity, he saw it for the first time um, um, or perceived it. It probably didn't occur to him. He was just serving God, but he saw the absolute grip that maybe that uh, the devil has on every human being. Uh, even possibly the um, the um, Israel, you know, Israel was under captivity. He saw, but he also saw. Now, side note, I don't want to give uh, Satan too much credit. You know, I, I, I once heard this great preach from Pete Gregg, and he was saying, you've got God here. Now, who's, you know, who's... Uh, who's his opponent and people think well you got God on this side on this side you've got the devil now that's probably not really a fair fight you know you could possibly say you've got angel Michael or angel Gabriel on this side which is an angel and you, on this side you've got a devil that's probably more the level you know I don't want to give the devil too much credit you know so hear me in that you know I don't want to sort of big him up too much that being said, it only took two angels to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, they're very, very powerful beings. You know, they are incredibly uh, beyond our comprehension on how they work and how they, they've got influence. And the devil has got a lot of influence. So at the same time, I don't also don't want to downplay his power and role over... Um, over this dominion but um the new the new in the new covenant i believe um what daniel was seeing was that when the people of god were receiving justification well the actual word was judgment and deemed righteous before god through the blood of jesus the enemy was defeated 
and the, uh, the throne of God, the throne of heaven, was established forever. Now, all this makes perfect sense in my head. It, 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 does it, is it making sense with you guys, or is it kind of a bit confusing? Because I'm trying to be clear, but it's very, very, it's going to quite, um, it's quite an abstract sort of thought. But basically, um, what Daniel's seeing and what's disturbing him, I believe, partly is the powerful nature and the influence that the enemy uh, has on the world. But I think even more than that, I just believe that there's a fear of God. There's a real fear of God that he receives, where he sees that throughout all this, it isn't the devil so powerful and God's really struggling to defeat him. It's actually, this is all going according to God's plan. And God is sovereign in all of this. He is sovereign in all of this. But there's a real call and there's a real urgency um, I believe that actually, how can I put this? That God's solution is his church, is his body, is us. It's us. It's him justifying us, which brings destruction to the enemy. Is that making sense? I, I said it, it doesn't quite feel right with me, but I'm not quite sort of saying it quite how I want to say it, but, you know, it's true. So um, anyway, where am I? Where am I? Have I finished? Is it? Um, can you? Yeah. Then the sovereignty power power and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints it will be handed over to us you've got to remember christ is now living in us you know it's uh, we're not over we're not in daniel situation where we're serving god um independently of christ living in us uh, we're new covenant christ lives in us we are in him and he is in us so therefore, the power, the kingdom of God lives in us. We have got authority over these things. And uh, so the whole of heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people, of the, most, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. Now, I don't quite know if this speaks to the um, other three beasts. I'll say it anyway, but it's a thought I had was um, we're Christians, we, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we are in Christ, Christ in us, um, but we live and it's evident that there is great darkness in the world, there's great injustice, there's great sorrow, there's great rubbish happening in the world and um, we are affected by it, you know, we have to be realistic, we we, we, we argue over um, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And it's all, you know, it's, there's so much stuff we as Christians don't agree with. Or, you know, and people are saying, thus says the Lord over everything. You know, it's just, there is, um, there's great, you know, there's great confusion. There is um, the, the enemy, though he's been defeated. It's that, it's that sort of thing that like Dave Mitchell quite often says it's the now and not yet nature of the kingdom. Yet, nevertheless, Christ lives in us and we have the authority. We have the authority. We have conquered the enemy to go out and take, take the ground. But I believe that for Daniel, it was a terrifying picture. I think actually we're in a privileged position that we can because we know Jesus, get a fuller picture and a fuller interpretation of Daniel's dream. You might disagree with that, but I believe that because we are in Christ, 
we get a fuller picture of what actually was going on. Daniel was aware of his unrighteousness before God. You know, a little bit later, he's terrified of the visions he's having because, you know, all this stuff's going on and he's thinking, I'm, I'm a sinner. I don't think he actually says it, but you get that impression that, you know, he, he, he gets the truth, but he's not quite in it like we are. Um, so I believe we're in a privileged situation. How long have I been ranting on for? Oh, I wanted to talk about um, a couple of my dreams. I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll talk about dream because um, I've had a couple of scary dreams and yet God has sort of used these. I'll talk about one, I had a couple. I'll talk about this one. Um, I think I shared it before. So I used to go to Ivy Church. Put your hand up if you know Ivy Church. It's the one in sort of St. Paul. You know, yeah, put your hand up if you like. Yeah, it's fine. I won't, I won't ask you up. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I used to go to Ivy Church, and um, one time this guy, he looked a bit like me, actually. He was mixed race, but he had really dirty teeth. Actually, I've got quite dirty teeth, so he looked just like me. Anyway, I was at Ivy Church, and he walked in, and he had a big grin. He was a bit sort of, you know, like, uh, look at me, I'm so cool. And anyway, so afterwards, he invited me. He invited, we got chatting. It was a bit off, but he invited me back to his house for um, a cup of tea. He lived on up the road to Coburg Road, I think it was. And uh, I went back to his house after church. He went downstairs and he says, oh, this is how I worship God. And uh, he goes down and before him, there was like this, it was a big poster with uh, like a, uh, it, it had a picture of, uh, I think maybe the Grail, but it was one of those 3D type weird sort of posters and in front of him he had some twigs and maybe a skull and uh in front of that he had a place where he would kneel and worship and i just had a really heavy satanic vibe about this whole thing and i was saying i was saying you know so this is how i worship god and i said oh you don't need any of that rubbish to worship god um all you need is to come to god through jesus christ and he looked at me and he said nobody knows you're here I said, that's true, but it doesn't change the fact that you need to go through Jesus Christ to worship God. And he goes, oh, okay. So anyway, <laughs> we become friends and he would come to my place um, and uh, I was living in a shared house and he would talk to me about devil, 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 devil. And, um, and I'd be going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And everybody else would be going, <laughs> just leave him to it. Anyway, I remember one night um, I was asleep and uh, actually it's not quite a dream, but I'll throw it in um, because it's relevant. Uh, it was the middle of summer. It's hot. My window's open because it's a hot sort of summer's night. And um, uh, during my dream, I just felt completely terrified and I woke up and I had a picture, like a vision of my friends kneeling before his altar, um, praying uh, satanically for these uh, demons to come and torment me. And uh, everything felt damp, though it was bone dry and really hot. Everything felt cold, everything felt damp. The walls felt mossy. The moon was terrifying. It's like a graveyard type moon, you know, and everything felt, it, it felt Halloween-y, if that makes any sense. It was just a, it was just awful. And I was absolutely terrified. And I was, had my bed covers over my head like this. And, and I was in my head, I was saying, um, Lord, Lord, do something, do something, do something. So I'm whispering, can you hear me? Wave if you can hear me. Yeah, thumbs up, because they can hear me. But I'm just, yeah. Lord, do something, do something, do something. And I just felt that steer voice of God say, just speak out the words, my Lord Jesus rebukes you. So inside my head, I was shouting, my Lord Jesus rebukes you. Nothing, absolutely nothing was happening. It was like I had my eyes closed, sheets over, everything felt 
absolutely terrifying. It was like there was demons running around my room. I'm sure if I looked, there wouldn't be, but well, I'm not sure maybe there would have been. That's a thought. But anyway, it was absolutely terrifying. And I was shouting in my head, nothing was happening. And um, I was saying, nothing's happening, nothing's happening in my head. God could hear. God says, you've got to speak it out. You've got to speak it out. I'm not speaking that out, not, not in here. I'm just, you know, I'm too scared. Do you know what I mean? It's like, what if I speak it out and nothing happens? They laugh at me or, you know, stop, kick my head in. It's just like, it, I was absolutely terrified. Um, so I squeaked it out like a little mouse. My, my Lord Jesus rebukes you. <laughs> it was literally like that. I spoke it because I was alone in my room going, my Lord Jesus rebukes you. All of a sudden, bang, it was like under a flood, a waterfall of God's love just filled that room, absolutely smashed in whatever horrible stuff, nasty stuff. It was like the contrast was night and day. And it was like within an instant, I was in an atmosphere of absolute praise to God, adoration. I was praising. And um, I remember... I'll just cut into the second story. I had a similar, I had a similar um, scenario at, at university maybe a year later where um, what happened was I felt this sort of presence in my room. I was sharing, uh, I was sharing a room uh, in the halls of residence. You had to share rooms with uh, other people. And this guy was a little bit into tarot cards and, you know, um, the guy I was sharing the room with. And, uh, and I got this sort of vibe going on. And I was going, I remember sort of sleeping. I couldn't sleep because there was this like de demonic presence in my room. And I was going, my Lord Jesus rebukes you. Like I was saying that. My Lord Jesus rebukes you. It wasn't staying. I was saying, oh, well, if you want to stay, stay, go. I don't care. I'm going to sleep. And I went to sleep, but, but it went before, you know, because God had used the previous dream to build up my faith level to have that understanding that actually I've got, demi I've got dominion over it. It hasn't got dominion over me. So the second scenario, I had the faith. Well, if you want to stay, hang around. I don't care. Do you know what I mean? Literally did not, could not care less. You know, I'm going to sleep. I'm tired. Another time I woke up, I asked, I asked God, wake me up when you wake up to pray. Three o'clock on the dot, woke me up. I thought, nah, <laughs> and I went back to sleep. I felt the Holy Spirit laugh at me, but anyway, that's another story. I actually have got a video. Um, have I got time? I don't know if I have time. It's a short video. It's, um, so I did get Daniel um, to sort of share a video to tell us how to, um, you know, we've been doing, showing these videos on, um, how to do dream interpretations, that sort of thing. Thumbs up if you realize that. Yeah, so I got Daniel to do one. All right, so I'll put it on. And then after that, are we finished? We're done. Okay, cool. Uh, it'll take me a second to set it up. So if you bear me for about 30 seconds. Hi, my name's Daniel, and Nick asked me to um, talk about dreams and how to interpret dreams. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get used to this phone. Um, we didn't have phones back in the day. But anyway, I remember a time when, um, you know, the king was going to have us all executed and chopped up into little pieces because um, he had a dream, he had a nightmare, as you do, and, um, and he wanted us to interpret it. But the problem we had, it wasn't, you know, it, it, you know, it wasn't 
the problem we had was he wouldn't tell us what the dream was and uh, he wanted us to tell him and uh, that was a bit difficult so what we had to do this is my advice and I'll share I'll share with you what I shared with the king that nobody can interpret dreams really nobody um, other than God you know God's the true interpreter and um, you know so don't look to us as being these great people but the God who we serve um, he's the one who interprets the dream and so uh, me and my friends um, I think it's Shadrach Meshach and Abednego I think or it might be someone else, I can't remember. Anyway, we got together and we prayed and we asked God for mercy. And um, at the end of the day, um, he showed us what the dream was and uh, showed us also showed us the interpretation. So um, my advice is if you want to interpret dream, then remember you can't interpret it and just humbly come before God. And, uh, you know, if he wants to let you know, he'll let you know. And, uh, you know, he's a good, merciful, loving God. Anyway, that's my advice for all dream interpretation. Bye. Brilliant. Okay, we're done. It's very cold in here. I'm sure you're very warm over there, especially in the Himalayas. It's probably really warm over there. Um, but it's cold here, so we're going to call it a day and say that's the end of the service. I'm going to pray and I just want to encourage you to speak to you in your dreams and you never know what will happen so Father God we thank you for this day thank you for Nick thank you for his servant heart and for his sharing thank you for the Bible and this incredible story of spiritual reality that goes beyond what we see and hear and can feel and touch and I just pray you'd help us Holy Spirit to stay awake awake to the reality of your kingdom and the truth of the dominion of your kingdom that will rule forever and ever. I pray a blessing on everyone that is listening, everyone that is here in the room. Just bless us. I pray that you'd keep us safe and fill us with your spirit and your power and your, um, your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen.